Patty LaBelle singing an upbeat blues song to a room full of off-duty soldiers in a soldier story, one of the new movies you're going to be reviewing this week on At the Movies. And across the aisle from me is Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And across the aisle from me, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to a soldier story, which also will be the subject of our special x-ray segment at the end of the show, we'll also be reviewing the comedy Irreconcilable Differences, starring Ryan O'Neill and Shelley Long as parents sued for divorce by their child. Also, John Cassavetti's Love Streams with Jenna Rollins. But first, Roger begins with the latest breakdancing movie, Body Rock. The latest and the last, if this is any indication, I hope, our movie is named Body Rock, and it's a victim of creepy music videoism. Somewhere in the middle of this movie, there may be the beginnings of a story, a fairly interesting story about how a street kid is made into an overnight star at a New York disco, and then is ripped off and cast aside after he no longer fits the plans of the club's rich owners. Well, that might have been an interesting story, but it's sidetracked, shot down, and buried in this movie beneath an avalanche of musical scenes that all look like auditions for MTV, as in this scene where the hero gets a breakdancing lesson from a kid. I'll show my magic moves to no one. Not your special stuff, right? I mean, just your basics. Your real basics. Oh, <laughs> come on, man. Better get your buck out, Joe. <laughs> All right. All right, Rockefeller. Let's see it. Just the basics. Just the basics. The very basics. Teamwork, yeah. Teamwork, yeah. Check it out. That's Leron A. Smith as little kid dancing there. And of course, it's typical of this movie. He really can dance. Yes. He can spin. He can move. So what do they do? They pull out every cheap gimmick in the book Speed and make him, him spin around. You know, I can spin that faster. They let me run through the machine. Yeah. It's terrific. No, it's typical. They're so unconfident of the material and of the characters mm -hmm. in this picture that they would rather trust their little gimmick machine and speed it up, make it fast, at least I the kids the may not notice they're being entertained. I have the feeling throughout this movie, the people who were producing it were trying to sit in the studio and make it better than it was to begin with. That was Lorenzo Lamas as the star who wants the singing or the dancing lessons, and you might recognize him from Falcon Crest, TV show that he's on. I, I don't think I recognize him from Falcon <laughs> Crest, but never seen it you either. might. As a would-be movie star, though, Lamas has talent. He can sing. He can dance. He's good in a couple of the movie's dramatic scenes. He is not the problem with this movie, but he and everybody else in the movie gets lost in the shuffle of musical overproduction. Body Rock looks like a shopping list for music video spare parts. It has lots of black light, lots of punk dress styles, lots of makeup and weird eyelashes and funny hair. And of course, we got the high-tech steel pipes so the spaced out disco dancers can chin themselves and do funny dances. But this movie doesn't have any respect for its mm. characters and it'll stop a scene instantly just to play a song. This movie is machine made. I think also the problem is Lamas. I didn't buy him in this mm. role. He looks about 10 years older than everyone else in the film. He, when he's asked to do rap music uh, as the disc jockey on the, on the set of their little nightclub, he, he does it badly. Uh, Travolta, you, you accepted as the best dancer in Saturday Night Fever. Here you don't uh, well, see him as the best per talented performer. Lamas is the wrong person for this movie, but yeah. that doesn't make him a bad performer. It just means he's in the wrong movie. This movie, we'll I think, was doomed from beginning to end, no matter who was in it or what they did. 
they cut away, what hurt me was that they cut away from the relationship between him and the girl back home from his neighborhood. Uh, that's going to be the sweetest part of this movie. It was also very sweet in Saturday Night Fever, and they but cut away from Did songs. you believe that at any point the people who made this movie cared about the story? No, I think no. they were Or the people in it, no. No, they're looking for the music video, they're looking for the rip Pump up the action. Pump that's up what the they've action. got, and they're stuck with if it. They could make this, if they could make this film in last 30 minutes with high speed, they'd done the whole film that way. <laughs> Coming up next at the movies, a little girl is fed up with her parents' selfishness, so she sues them for divorce from her. I'm ready, Mr. Hanner. I want to divorce my parents. The next film is called Irreconcilable Differences, an awkward title but a good film, a surprisingly serious comedy about a couple of show business parents looking after their own professional careers while ignoring their daughter to the point that she sues them for divorce because she'd rather spend her life with the family housekeeper who at least pays some attention to her. Ryan O'Neill and Shelley Long play the selfish parents and Drew Barrymore, the alligator in the sewers girl from E.T., plays the put-upon child. This whole thing is so crazy. You are eight years old. What are you doing? I am nine. Can you hold still for just a minute? I'm sorry that you overheard your father and I fighting that day. We shouldn't have involved you, I know. But dragging us into court, I mean, suddenly we're a media event. Mother, you and Dad for a long time did not recognize my rights as a human being. You both treat me like chattel. You cannot do with me as you please anymore. We have a reconcilable thing. That scene sort of looks like the start of some TV sitcom, but it gets more serious after that. That is the scene, in fact, that the movie starts with. We are then taken back in time to a more innocent time to when Ryan O'Neill, which is a college film professor, and Shelley Long, a young housewife-to-be, engaged to be married. The two of them meet while he's hitchhiking. They fall in love on the road to California, and at a motel in California, Shelley Long is confronted by the boyfriend she has promised to marry. <laughs> Who's that? The guy from the coffee shop. I ordered us some breakfast. You know, great sex. Always, always makes me hungry, darling. Lucy! Nothing. I'm supposed to be a virgin. You are? Oh, you got to let me sit. I'll handle this. Oh, Lucy, oh. what's going on in oh. there? Albert, remember, he's trained to kill. <clears throat> Lucy! Bink? Who are you? A uh, lot's happened since you saw Lucy last. I asked you who you were, you be. Please put me down, Bink. I'm obviously not going to hurt you. I said, put me down. Well, he picks himself up off the floor, and they do get married, and they have that baby, and everything looks great. But then, selfishly, they start pursuing their own careers in the movie world, and that leads to all sorts of complications, some of them very funny, some of them quite sad. At the center of this movie, though, is the story of that little girl who is ignored, definitely a little girl lost. Irreconcilable Differences is being advertised as a comedy, and it does have a number of funny scenes, but I must admit, I took this film seriously, as seriously as a picture, say, as Kramer versus Kramer, and its depiction of where marriages and indeed lives go wrong. It's a good film. I think it's a good film, too. And you know, right at the beginning, when she says, I want a super divorce, yeah. and she's talking to the lawyer, I'm thinking, this is going to be another retread of Little Miss Marker with a cute little girl, and then we're going to yes. have Ryan O'Neill and Shelley Long, and they're going to be, you know, plastic television yes. type images. It's amazing how quickly this movie begins to capture us with the wit of its dialogue, with the imagination of the situations. Those are good performances by yes. O'Neill and Long. That's what caught me yeah. by surprise. O'Neill's first good movie in a long time. Long time. And there's a lot of sharp, satirical observation in the film that I wasn't expecting. Same writer as from, as from Private Benjamin. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised at Ryan O'Neill's performance because I haven't seen him in good work. And Shelley Long, I saw her in a little movie she made, uh, saw a teenage sex comedy uh -huh. I can't even remember the name of. Uh, she probably doesn't want me to remember the name of it. She's very good here, too, because she has this innocence. And we see how, how in this little story, how Hollywood corrupts. They find these two innocents that come, <laughs> come out west, and the system devours them, but with their complicity. And again, there are so many shots in this movie that are beautifully shot where you see them talking enthusiastically about their careers, and then in the corner mm -hmm. is this little girl. They've made their choice. It's a real good movie. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Irreconcilable differences. Is that title going to sink the movie? Well, I thought Romancing the Stone would sink Romancing the Stone, and it didn't. Okay. Who knows?
We'll see. Next at the movies, a black sergeant is murdered in 1944 in the Deep South in a soldier story. Sir, may I say something, though? It sure is good seeing one of us wearing... A popular black army sergeant who is shot dead one night as he stumbles home drunk from a bar near an army base in Louisiana. This is in 1944. Who killed him? The first suspects are the local whites who aren't too happy about the all-black army units that are undergoing training near their hometown, but then the case grows more complicated. An army lawyer is brought in from Washington to investigate it, and he's a black man, too. In fact, he's the first black officer that most of the people in this movie have ever seen. Here's a scene soon after he arrives on the base. I've lived here in Hunter Parish three years. I'm fond of the place. I like the duty. You get my meaning? What is it you want, Colonel? I want whatever it is you came here to do completed in three days. Sir, I request immediate permission to notify Washington. Permission denied. I'm under direct order. I don't give a damn if Roosevelt himself sent you, Davenport. I'm trying to prevent my colored troops from going into that backwater town and killing somebody. And I don't care what you think. You can always return to Washington if you like. No, sir. I was assigned this case and I intend to file a report. Sir. That is Howard E. Rollins Jr. as the captain in charge of the investigation. You might remember him from Ragtime, which won him an Oscar nomination, but I don't think he's going to get another nomination for a soldier's story. He's so laid back and low key in this movie that he never really brings the role the energy that it requires. He seems to be holding back all the time, kind of like a Sidney Poitier performance of 10, 20 years ago. The best performance in the movie is by Adolph Caesar, who plays the murdered sergeant. And in a series of flashbacks, we learn that he's a racist, a black man who thinks that other blacks should always try to make a good impression on white people. I'm a soldier, Peterson. And the kind of colored man that don't like lazy, shiftless Negroes. Well, sir, you ain't got to come in here calling us names. The Nazis called you Schwarzer. You gonna complain to Hitler they hurt your little feelings? It don't look like to me we could do too much to them Nazis with paintbrushes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you trying to mock me, CJ? No, sir, sir. Good. Because whatever an ignorant, low-class Geechee like you has to say ain't worth paying attention to. Is it? <laughs> Is it? I reckon not, sir. You a creep, Waters. Saw him just joking, Pete. He don't mean no harm. No, he does. I mean, we're taking up from them white boys. Yes, you do. And if it wasn't for you southern niggas, white folks wouldn't think we was all fools. Well, where are you from? England? That's one of the flashbacks in the movie showing why almost everybody on this base has a motive for murdering that sergeant. It's kind of like Agatha Christie's mousetrap. He offends everyone, and then which guy is the one who killed him. A soldier story has a lot of flashbacks like that one, and they destroy the tension of the movie, I think. The basic problem with the story is that the army lawyer doesn't know who committed the murder, and we don't know, but the movie does know, and it keeps dropping his little hints all along the way until the end, where the murder is solved not by a clever investigation, but by the movie simply telling us who did it. It's all too cut and dried. I would have rather had the story of that sergeant and his relationship with his men and rather Roger. than laying in the overplot of the investigation. And that's why I like the movie, because it did just that. It told at the center of this movie. Mm -hmm. I couldn't care less, really, who murdered it. It's a gimmick, okay? Mm -hmm. Of course it is. Okay. It does tell the story. That scene that we just saw mm -hmm. there is one of the most powerful scenes I've seen in a long time, and that's really at the center of this film. We see racism per presented not as racist attacking this person that they don't like, but rather we see this sergeant who is the racism has turned in on himself mm -hmm. and he destroys everything around him, including himself. It's well, a very touching I, story. This guy, Adolf Caesar, you you mentioned his name and properly so. He's gonna get an Oscar nomination, at least I hope so. He's very good. I think it's interesting that you have found the center of the movie in a place where the movie didn't put its center. This movie probably thinks Mm -hmm. It's about Howard Rollins coming to that army base. You may be right. Quizzing everybody, uh, having the investigation, going through... That's uh, the so-called sexy part, yes. yes. And forget about that. I wish they, they could have. have done without that character, told mm -hmm. the rest in chronological order, mm -hmm. had more of the Caesar character, and had a much better movie. To mm -hmm. me, the structure is what sabotages the effect of this film. I think it's a very powerful film, despite the structure. I think that audiences will be thinking, not about Howard Rollins at the end of this film, but about the Adolf Caesar character, mm -hmm. that sergeant. 
That is a character worth remembering. I'm glad I met him in this fine film. Our next film is Love Streams, another troubling, joyful, strange, moody film from John Cassavetes, one of the most challenging, original, but sometimes often repetitive American filmmakers working today. Love Streams features the usual Cassavetes Road Company of himself, his wife Jenna Rollins, and Seymour Cassell in the story of a deeply troubled divorced woman, played by Jenna Rollins, and her brother Cassavetes, a self-destructive Hollywood writer. He's divorced too. And one of the most touching moments in this film is when he meets his young son for the very first time. I need a picture of you. My father tore it up. But my mother cried. And they had a big fight and he hit her. And they changed my name to Talby Swanson, my kids. And your mother cries all the time thinking about you. Please come back to her. She, uh, she sleeps with another man every night, you know, who, you know what that means to me. And she <clears throat> has had a baby by another man. So that part of, that part of, uh, is over. I don't like women anyway, you know. I really don't. I, I like kids. Uh, older people because they uh, seem to have the secret to just, you know, they don't need anything. You don't need anything. They just want, you're innocent, you know, and so are older people. They're innocent. That's, that's what I like about them. Drink your drink here. I like what he has to say about older people and young people. And I also appreciate that in an American movie, a man saying he doesn't like women. We have a lot of men in American movies, frequently heroes of films who don't like women. They never admit it. Now, Love Streams is not a perfect film. It runs into what is getting to be sort of a predictable, crazy moment for a film with John Cassavetes, with a herd of animals making an appearance as some kind of Noah's Ark, love is all we need message. That's a much too calculated bit of weirdness. But on balance, I like Love Streams. I like its difference from most American movies. I like the wisdom, the often unconscious wisdom, of its crazy characters. You know what I liked about it was, I liked it because it didn't do what a soldier story did. It doesn't have any visible structure at all. Mm -hmm. It introduces some characters, they spend some time together, other people come in by taxi, mm -hmm. they're always unloading in front of Cassavetes' house, yeah. they leave, they're all crazy. Everyone in this movie is very sick, and yet at the same time they are all in some strange way trying to carry on a parody of what they believe to be normal life. Mm -hmm. The movie is totally unpredictable from one moment to the next. The kid turns up out of nowhere, yeah. Cassavetes takes him to Vegas. Yeah. The next day he's back, then his sister turns up. Yeah. Then she goes and buys out the pet store. There is no moment in this movie where you have any idea what's going to happen next, and I like that. Yeah, I like that to a point, a point at which a film can be so unpredictable that that becomes a style. And I felt that toward the end there, when I mentioned the one scene that sort of set me off on the edge, uh, I felt that was too much. I would have liked a little bit of structure, at least a, maybe a quicker uh, ending. But there's no question. We're talking about a film that dares to take chances. There's a, there's a single shot of Jenna Rollins confessing to her brother John Cassavetes in the film that she wants to buy him a baby because that's going to cure him. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. It's mixed up. But there is a grain of truth in that. We need connections, which is one of the, film, one of the things this film is saying. Yeah, I think it's a good film. Next at the movies, another one of our special x-ray segments. And this one is on the image of black men in the movies. Like these, they're like MacArthur's. Our X-ray subject this week: the image of black men in American movies. One of the most striking aspects of a soldier's story is that it gives a large number of roles to adult black male actors portraying what I'd call average guys. Not superheroes like Fred Williamson in The Big Score, or cute little boys like Gary Coleman on TV and in the movies On the Right Track, and not wisecracking dudes like Eddie Murphy in 48 Hours. But no soldier stories, we see regular, ordinary human beings. As rare as black American movies have been in the last few years, even more scarce has been the number of roles of regular guys who just happen to be black. And thinking back upon the last decade of American movies, only three such characters stand out for me. One was the career sailor played by Otis Young in the wonderful movie The Last Detail, also starring Jack Nicholson. And I also think back to the garbage man played by James Earl Jones in the fine drama Claudine. 
Another rare example of a black man who was a man first and black second. And most recently, of course, Lou Gossett in the Academy Award winning role of that drill sergeant in An Officer and a Gentleman. Now, A Soldier's Story, the film that triggered these thoughts, does have race as its leading issue. But a curious thing happens during the course of this film. Because there are so many different kinds of black men in this film, we saw it earlier in the show, after a while, they begin to stand out as men, not as black men. And this, for me, is an exciting development in American movies, but sad to say, it's much too early to call it a trend. You don't think it's a trend, do you? Uh, it's not a trend, but maybe a soldier story will bring a lot of real good actors to the attention of people. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. We both voted thumbs down on Body Rock, the feature-length music video masquerading as a movie. But two positive responses to irreconcilable differences. The charming comedy about a little girl who walks out on her preoccupied parents. A split decision on a soldier story. Gina admired it more than I did. I thought it was contrived and